asking your questions throughout the broadcast using both the questions and chat features in the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. Please note this is the only way to interact with us today as all attendees will be muted. As time permits, we will give our presenters an opportunity to respond to questions at the end of the presentation. This presentation, as are all of FAIR's webinars, uh, they will be, it will be recorded and posted on FAIR's website in about seven to ten days. So we'd like to thank all of you, of course, for joining us today, and we also want to give thanks to our sponsor for today's webinar, which was made possible through generous support from Mylan. Our speaker today is Dr. Stephanie Leonard. Dr. Leonard has been living with a life-threatening peanut allergy since childhood and has dedicated her career to helping those living with food allergy live safe, happy, and fulfilling lives. She is currently the director of the Food Allergy Center at Rady Children's Hospital and is an assistant clinical professor at the University of California, San Diego. She received her medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons, where she also did her pediatric residency. She completed her fellowship in allergy and immunology at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York under the mentorship of Hugh Sampson, one of the leading experts in the field. Dr. Leonard oversees clinical trials in food allergy treatment in children and conducts food allergy research. Her goal is to help find a cure for food allergy. And at this time, I am delighted to turn the presentation over to Dr. Leonard. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Um, as Lynn mentioned, um, I've been living with a peanut allergy since I was age two. So I'll be speaking uh, today um, from personal experience, but we'll also be going over advice that I give to my patients on a daily basis. I wanted to start out by discussing the difference between an allergy and an intolerance. Allergists consider a food allergy to be an abnormal response from the immune system to a food protein. And specifically, we'll be focusing today on IgE-mediated or immediate type allergies. IgE is the immune system's allergic antibody that recognizes food and causes a reaction to it. This is the type of allergy that you can test for. It's the type where you're at risk for anaphylaxis or a severe allergic reaction, and it can be life-threatening. Also in this category is the pollen food or oral allergy syndrome that uh, we often see in adults who have pollen allergy. There's a protein in pollen that cross-reacts in many fr fresh fruits and vegetables. These adults tend to describe oral itching with certain fresh fruits and vegetables. And this allergy tends to be more mild, so not systemic. Um, celiac disease is also a, an immune response to a wheat protein. Um, Non-celiac gluten intolerance is something that we're seeing more of, and we don't quite know what the mechanism of it is yet. Intolerances are when you have an adverse uh, reaction to a food that isn't through the immune system. So for example, if you have lactose intolerance, that's a metabolic issue. You have trouble digesting the sugar in milk, but you can still tolerate the milk protein. So as long as you're eating something without lactose, you should be fine. Um, other chemicals can also cause adverse reactions in foods um, or other preservatives, for example, in foods can also cause adverse reactions. Um, but these are all uh, considered intolerances and not to be life-threatening. Uh, next slide. Uh, I also wanted to review the signs of anaphylaxis, uh, which is a severe allergic reaction. Different symptoms that you could have in an allergic reaction include rashes or the skin, respiratory difficulty breathing, gastrointestinal such as vomiting or diarrhea, cardiovascular such as low blood pressure, and neurologic, so anxiety or feeling of impending doom. We consider an allergic reaction to be anaphylaxis when you have two or more parts of your body involved, such as a rash and a cough. The two most dangerous symptoms in an allergic reaction are difficulty breathing and a drop in blood pressure. And you might have a drop in blood pressure if you feel dizzy, lightheaded, weak, or you're pale or blue. It is epinephrine that treats both of these most dangerous symptoms. It's important to know that you can have anaphylaxis even without having skin symptoms, um, but in majority of cases we do see skin symptoms. Personally, myself, I usually get gastrointestinal symptoms, but more recently have also had some uh, tightness of my chest. Um, and so I've all, all, I have used um, epinephrine in previous reactions. Next slide. Uh, Life-threatening food allergies in adults affect about 9 million adults, or 3 to 4 percent, um, in the U.S. 
we see higher uh, prevalence of food allergy in children, about 8%. And the reason we see less in adults is because many children may outgrow food allergies, such as to egg, milk, soy, and wheat. But it's harder to outgrow food allergies to peanut, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. And that's often why we see these food allergies primarily in adults. Most uh, food allergies may develop in childhood, but you can develop food allergies at any age. Next slide. There was a study done uh, in adults in New York um, at Mount Sinai, and they found that 85% of patients who were seen in internal medicine with a food allergy diagnosis were women. This may be a little skewed because we know that men often don't seek out health care as much as women do. But we do uh, think from other studies, or we do believe from other studies, that more women uh, tend to have food allergies, whereas in childhood we see more boys with, with food allergies. About 86% of those adult patients that had a physician diagnosed food allergy received a prescription for self-injectable epinephrine, which is good, but only about 50% of them had their food allergy evaluated by an allergy specialist. And we do believe that it is beneficial to see an allergist at least once if you're an adult with a food allergy uh, because education is a huge part of food allergy management. Next slide. The risk of a fatality for a food allergic child is approximately 1 in 800,000 per year. We don't really know the statistics in adults, but by experience, we do tend to see more severe reactions in adults, uh, primarily because they tend to involve more respiratory or cardiovascular blood pressure issues. We do know that adult, adolescents and young adults are at highest risk, and primarily we think that's because of increased risk taking. So they're no longer with their parents, they're off on their own. They, they may not remember the reaction they had when they were very little, and so could, maybe can't recognize an allergic reaction. They may not carry their auto-injectable epinephrine, or they may not use it. They may be too embarrassed to tell someone they have a food allergy or tell someone when they're sick. Uh, so we do, uh, this is a group that we particularly focus on. Next slide. While uh, food allergy fatalities are very rare and general as a rule, uh, food, the fear of that does affect quality of life in people who have food allergy. There are studies looking at this, and one study, compared to the general population, it was found that food allergic adults reported poor overall health, more limitations in social activities, and less fatality. Overall, food allergic patients reported poor health-related quality of life than patients with diabetes. And I often compare living with food allergies with diabetes in the sense that you have to think about your food allergy on a daily basis every time you eat. Next slide. There are also studies looking at uh, other psychosocial impacts of food allergy and bullying. For example, in one study, 45% of children reported bullying and 30% of them directly because of their food allergy. And this happens, uh, the things that happen are either that they're teased, um, more concerning that the food that they're allergic to is waved in front of them or thrown at them, that they're criticized or threatened. Most of the bullying uh, was reported to be from classmates or students, but 11% from teachers and staff. That's really concerning. That means that we still have to educate the public and even adults about how serious food allergies can be and how difficult it can be to live with them. The bullying was associated in the study with decreased quality of life and increased distress in parents and children, independent of reported severity of allergy. Now, bullying doesn't only happen in children, it can also happen in adults. Uh, there was one report in the news of a, a famous Hollywood actor who knew that his uh, fellow actor had a nut allergy and hid it in one of his um, in his meals. Um, that actor ended up having a reaction that ambulance had to be called. Uh, so it's something that we do need to educate the public about, that uh, food allergies can be life-threatening, they're serious, and it's not something to joke about because people can be harmed. Next slide. Uh, the psychosocial impact um, primarily comes from feeling restricted. So um, uh, restrictions on social activities, uh, restrictions on where you can travel, and even in your career choice. I do have older teenagers who come into my office and they're interested in joining the Army. And in the Army or the, um, any of the armed forces, uh, you can't have a food allergy, um, you know, because you may be in a far off place and there's only one source of food. 
Um, and a lot of those kids come in hoping that they've outgrown their food allergy, they want to be retested or challenged, and some of them I can help and others it's likely that they have a lifelong food allergy. Also, if you do have a food allergy, you do have to consider if you are interested in working in food service or at a restaurant, um, depending on what your food allergy is, there may be limitations there as well. It's important to find support. Uh, when I was uh, a child, I was the only person I knew with a food allergy. That's changed nowadays. About two children in every classroom now have a food allergy, which means as these children grow up, there's going to be more and more adult, uh, adults with food allergy. Not until I was in college or medical school did I meet other people my age with food allergies. It's important to have that support um, because it's only those type of people who know or someone who has a first degree relative or a spouse with a food allergy who understand how it affects your daily life. There are online boards um, that you can join uh, to find people who also have food allergies like you. Um, you can look for support groups uh, within your uh, area or if there isn't one, consider starting one. And in the end, it's important to seek counseling if anxiety, fears, phobias, or even depression are interrupting your daily life. The mo a majority of adults with food allergy um, can live uh, fulfilling lives, and you can too. It's important to seek out help if you need it. Next slide. So today I'm going to talk about food allergy management in different areas, such as at home, at work, when dining out, traveling, camping and hiking, and in relationships. Next slide. First, I want to discuss allergen in the environment. I have a lot of people asking me, how severe is my food allergy? Can I be in the same room as, as the food I'm allergic to? What do I have to be careful about? In general, I, I usually don't label someone as having either a mild or a severe allergy. You either have one or you don't, and if you do have one, I want you to be prepared, carry your emergency medications, and make sure you're avo strictly avoiding that food. Currently, we have no uh, cure for food allergy, but it is something that we are working on in research. The general rule is you have to ingest a food to have a systemic reaction or anaphylaxis. If, someone is, if you are allergic to peanut and someone's sitting next to you eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you can smell the peanut butter, that smell is not going to cause a reaction. The smell is a chemical, it's an aromatic in the air. It's not the protein that actually causes the reaction. Now certainly you may feel anxious by sitting next to someone who's eating something you're allergic to, and that anxiety can cause symptoms that feel like throat tightness and nausea. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. If you're not sure and you are feeling something, I always advise to go ahead and treat. Now there are exceptions to the rule that you have to ingest something to have a reaction. If you get enough protein into the air and then you inhale that protein, it is possible to develop some symptoms. And that would be, for example, if you're standing next to somebody who's roasting nuts, or if someone's boiling milk, or steaming eggs, fish, or shellfish, or if someone is sifting flour and you inhale that. When you touch something that you're allergic to, you may have some superficial redness, itching, or hives, but as long as you don't get that into your eyes, your nose, or your mouth, it's not going to turn into, or it's very, very unlikely to enter, ter, turn into a systemic reaction. In that case, you just want to wash the area um, where you've touched the food allergen, um, and if there's any uncomfortableness, you can use antihistamine. Next slide. It's important for people with food allergies to be aware of cross-contact. That means that even traces of uh, allergen, or the food that you're allergic to, is in contact with the, food, the safe food that you're eating, it can make it unsafe. The classic example is when someone uses a knife, dips it into the peanut butter, and then dips it into the jelly jar, now the jelly is contaminated and you can't eat it. Same thing, if a pan is used to fry fish and you're allergic to fish and then it's used to cook vegetables, now the vegetables are contaminated and you should not eat them. It's important to know that if a mistake is made, it cannot be undone. The safe food needs to be prepared again from scratch. That means, for example, at a restaurant, they can't just remove the nuts from the salad and give it back to you. Or scraping off cheese off a sandwich or off a pizza, there's still going to be some traces of allergen that could cause a reaction. Next slide. There are special places um, where cross-contact is more likely to happen that food allergic people should be aware of. And one of those is a buffet or a salad bar. So all the food is laid out together. And if you sometimes one serving spoon may be used in one dish um, and also in another one, and you don't know. Um, I usually advise that if there's a buffet, 
if you can spot the thing that you're allergic to, don't eat anything around in that area. The safest thing to do really is to talk to the chef and ask if they could prepare some food uh, for you separately before they bring it out to the buffet to give to you. Ice cream shops are very, it's very important to realize that if you walk into an ice cream shop and ask them to use a new spoon or a clean spoon, um, that's not the only thing you need to consider. Before you've even walked into that shop, that um, a scoop may have been used in an ice cream that has your allergen in it and then used in the ice cream that you would like to, to buy. Um, that means that the entire container of the ice cream that you want to buy has already been contaminated before you've even walked in the door and using a brand new spoon is not going to help. Um, you will hit jackpot if you walk into an ice cream store and you ask them how they deal with food allergies and they're willing to open a brand new ice cream container for you and use a brand new spoon. That's happened to me at least twice um, and it almost brought tears to my eyes. It's um, amazing when they actually go through um, all that effort to accommodate you. But that is the safest thing to do in an ice cream shop. In bakeries, I do warn people, especially if you're allergic to peanut, for example, but are eating other nuts, um, sometimes if they run out of a certain nut, they may throw another one in, and peanuts are definitely cheap. Um, so be careful and ask a lot of questions in bakeries. Uh, it's uh, better that when you can actually buy something packaged that have ingredients on it. Of course, food counters, I like deli counters and seafood counters, same issue as the buffet. You have a lot of food in one area, and the risk for cross-contact is large. Next slide. Um, in terms of grocery shopping, I usually advise people to avoid bulk bins. Um, that's the same issue. Uh, you don't know what has been in the bin before. You don't know if they've cleaned it out. You don't know if someone used the scoop in that one bin for something else first and then put it back in. Uh, same issue with the food counters and the food bars as with the buffets. The risk for cross-contact con is great, and I would avoid those. I would also avoid foods that are packed in-house in a store without a list of ingredients, especially if you can't talk to the chef or food preparer um, and ask them questions. If other people in your household are eating foods that you're allergic to, you want to make sure that when you're grocery shopping that those unsafe foods are separate from the safe foods in a cart and when bagged and taking home. I also always, always emphasize reading ingredients and labels every time, even if it's a brand that you have used for years. You never know when the manufacturing processes may change. Um, <clears throat> I've had uh, two experiences. One, um, I used to eat Twix. The, the, that was my favorite candy bar. And then they came out with a peanut butter Twix. Um, and the warning label showed up on the regular Twix. I did one time have an itchy mouth after eating um, a plain Twix and from, na from then on have been avoiding it. Um, so again, especially if they add new flavors, uh, that can present a new problem. You do always need to check the label. Um, another situation, I ran into um, is that the pre-prepared cookie dough, for example, made by one company in a tube was safe as a sugar cookie. Um, but that same cookie in um, a packaging where they had separated out the serving so you could just put it on the cookie sheet, that uh, preparation of the cookie dough, um, all of a sudden, uh, when I looked at the ingredients, I noticed that they had nut flours in it. It was macadamia nut and peanut uh, flour and almond flour. Um, and I don't know why it was so different within the same brand, um, maybe because it was more stable, etc. But it's important to know that, for example, if someone brings to work um, a sugar cookie or some cookie that you think um, should be safe if you're not allergic, always, always you need to read the ingredients and labels because you never know when something like that is going to turn up. Next slide. Uh, so let's talk about cooking in the kitchen. Um, it's always a good idea to prepare the safe food first. Uh, some families uh, decide to use dedicated uh, safe utensils, dishes, or appliances, so they're all the same color or they have some kind of wording on it. Um, some people may use a dedicated safe area in the kitchen. Uh, in restaurants, the picture on the right, um, some have um, kits uh, like the one that you see, um, and purple is the general uh, food, uh, allergy safe color in, in some restaurants. And when a food allergic customer comes in, they take down that kit and it has um, uh, cleaned and fresh utensils as well as sometimes surface, and they prepare that food allergic customer's food um, in that area. Not all restaurants have that, um, but more of them are starting to. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about restaurants in a bit. Uh, back to the kitchen, uh, you want to serve the food allergic individual first and separately, meaning not carrying the same dishes um, out together. 
That actually um, happened to me once in uh, a restaurant where when I told them I had a peanut allergy, they told me they were going to prepare my food separately and then they brought my food out immediately after it was prepared without having it sit in the kitchen and possibly be contaminated by, contaminated by other food. In fact, they brought out my entire table's um, dishes before even our neighbors who had been there before us um, and I really appreciate that. That doesn't always happen but that was, that was, a, nice, that was a good experience at a restaurant. Um, and also you want to avoid make your own spreads, like make your own sundaes, because of the same reason of cross contact like in a buffet. In terms of food storage, you want to think more about squeeze um, bottles for condiments so that there's no double dipping. Um, you may want to label foods at home, you may want to have de dedicated shelves for safe foods, and you want to consider keeping unsafe foods below the safe foods so um, contamination across contact can't drop into the, same food, the safe foods. Next slide. Um, some people may want to use dedicated utensils and dishes and um, um, or you can make sure that they are cleaned before being used uh, for the safe foods. You want to make sure that when you're cleaning utensils and dishes, etc., that you're scrubbing with soap and water. That is the best way to get allergen off. You also have to consider um, that now the sponge or the brush could be contaminated and you want to make sure you rinse the residue off or you can use dedicated sponges and brushes. You want to, uh, it's important to know that dishwashers do not remove all of the allergens. You have to rinse off the food residue first before putting them in. And alcohol sanitizers do not remove allergens. So you need to use wet, wet wipes and scrub if you're cleaning down a surface, for example. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about family, friends, and coworkers and um, uh, managing your food allergies. Um, not everybody understands what it's like to have a food allergy, especially um, adults and in, in, um, older generations who haven't seen a lot of food allergy. Um, they may they may forget. Um, I'm I'm peanut allergic and I'm an allergist. Yet I have a friend who has a fish allergy and I continuously forget that she has this and I keep on trying to invite her out for sushi. Um, so even I forget, but it's because it's that particular allergy is not forefront in my daily life. Um, your friends or your family may want to help but not fully understand, um, like this cartoon. I love food, al food allergy fun. Um, they, they really get what it's like to have a food allergy. And here in this cartoon, someone says, well, you're allergic to milk. That's fine. Just you know, don't drink milk. But they don't realize that milk is in so many other foods and you have to think about it constantly. Um, they may get offended uh, when you don't trust them. Or, um, for example, in one situation, um, my aunt had made a salad dressing and it was a little bit creamy and I wasn't sure what was in it. And so I, had a I asked her, you know, could I see the ingredients or could you give me the recipe? Um, and I didn't realize that she hadn't made it, that she had actually gotten it from a box. And she was a little embarrassed that she had to admit that she got it from the box and didn't make it. Um, so I felt bad, but I'm still glad that I checked the ingredients um, to keep myself safe. So one of the things that you can do is, you know, whoever made the food or the chef, you can pull them aside um, and ask them um, um, questions instead of doing it in front of everybody. You don't want to make them feel bad if they've made a mistake or, um, or if they forgot. Um, it's important to use patience and humor with the people around you. Um, they really you know, want to make sure that you're safe, um, but may not understand all the nuances. Um, sometimes I say uh, things like, oh, you know, do you mind if I talk to the chef? I don't want to make a big scene and call an ambulance in the middle of a wedding. Or um, do you mind if I check the ingredients? You know, I have, a, I have a big day tomorrow and I have no time to go to the ER today. Um, you might want to explain your fears, your anxiety, your past experiences. You know, I had experience uh, a reaction once to a very, very small amount of peanut, and that's why I'm so careful. Um, give them credit for trying to accommodate you, um, but don't get into an unsafe situation because you don't want to hurt their feelings. Um, you always want to think about your safety first, um, but you can always do it in a way um, where it doesn't make somebody else feel bad um, or put yourself in a situation uh, um, where, where people don't want to invite you back, for example. There's always a way, a good way to do it, and it depends on who's around you. Next slide. So these are my golden rules for managing food allergy. Um, be prepared, uh, just like a uh, Boy Scout. Um, I'm going to mention over and over again to always have safe food with you. Um, that is the key to making sure that you don't get it, um, that you don't miss out on social activities. Um, ask questions. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Um, if you're not sure, my bottom line is 
don't eat it. It's not worth it. It's not worth ending up in the ER, going to the hospital. Um, it takes up the rest of your day. Um, so uh, it's better not to when you're not sure. Get involved. Um, offer to help plan parties, especially when there's food involved, or pick a restaurant. Help others help you. Meaning, um, you know, if you wouldn't mind, can you bring me the, the ingredients? Can you save the label so I could read it myself? Um, and then make sure that someone knows around you about your food allergy and what to do in case of an emergency. And this is very important, especially at work and also when traveling. Next slide. So being prepared, um, always, always have safe snacks or food with you. Um, I, I'm a person who uh, my blood sugar gets low very quickly, and so I have to eat throughout the day. I always have something in my purse um, or bag. Uh, I have a secret stash at work that has safe foods for me. And in that case, so if they have a surprise celebration for someone's birthday, etc., you can grab something and still participate, even if you can't or you don't know if you can have the food that is um, that is uh, uh, provided. Always carry your emergency medications. That means your antihistamine and your auto-injectable epinephrine. Um, you, this is a case where you'd rather have it and not need it than be in a situation where you really need it and, and are missing it and it takes you longer to get to medical help and to uh, treat the reaction. The longer the reaction goes, the worse it can get. So it's important to treat early and treat, um, and treat fully. Um, you also want to have medical alert identification on you. Um, this can be like a medic alert bracelet um, or a card in your wallet um, or, uh, next slide, there are now um, apps uh, for smartphones that can contain your medical uh, um, identif identification information in an emergency. So this is actually on an iPhone. I just discovered this the other day. If you have the health app, if you go into the health app and go under medical ID, you can enter things like your name, emergency contact, what your allergies are, what medications you're carrying, and other information. And if you were to end up in the ER, the physician, without you knowing your uh, code to get into your phone can get to this information. They would basically click on the emergency button um, when you first turn on your phone that goes to that area where you can make an emergency call and then click on medical ID and all that information comes up. Um, this particular one is for iPhone but they also have ones for Androids as well and I highly recommend checking out your smartphone to see if you can add that extra protection um, on you. Next slide. Um, so always, always carry your epinephrine auto injectors if you have a food allergy. We recommend carrying two devices, and that's because in about 30% of severe reactions, more than one epin uh, epinephrine device may be needed. Um, the I had one situation where I had a very buff 19-year-old uh, come into the ER, and we ended up having to use uh, four doses of epinephrine on him. Um, but he had been reacting for a long time, so it was probably part of the reason. Uh, but we don't really know what the exact dose that we need to treat uh, anaphylaxis is. And so even though um, using four doses is, is extremely rare, um, it's not uncommon to need more than one. Uh, you also want to remember to renew your epinephrine auto injectors annually. They usually expire after a year. Check the expiration date on them. Um, the, you also want to remember to keep them at room temperature. Um, if they're ever exposed to either extreme heat or extreme cold, uh, you do want to contact your physician to get new ones. Uh, you definitely don't want to leave them in a car, especially in um, areas where it gets very hot in the summer. You always want to keep it um, in a bag with you, and um, if you're in a, a hot, um, if the if the weather is hot, you're uh, um, or you're at the beach, for example, you want to keep it next to something cool. Not necessarily on ice, because that would be too cold, but next to something cool and in the shade. Um, you always want to call 911 after you have used your uh, epinephrine auto injector. That is not because epinephrine is a dangerous medication. It's because you've had a significant enough reaction that you need somebody to check you out. You may need other medications like oxygen or IV fluids. Um, and it's also important to know that um, there's something called a biphasic reaction, where after the first reaction goes away, four to six hours later, sometimes symptoms may reappear. So when people go to the emergency room, I often recommend that they be watched for at least four to six hours. It's very important that if you have a reaction and you are by yourself, to use your, epipen your epinephrine auto-injector and call 911. 
um, you don't want to drive yourself to the emergency room. There was an unfortunate story a couple years ago where a college student used his epinephrine auto injector and then drove himself to the ER and he continued to have symptoms. Um, and he was a case of a fatal anaphylaxis. So it's not something that you want to get yourself into, uh, a situation that you want to get yourself into. Um, if you are um, having a reaction, make sure to tell someone around you. Um, don't treat it by yourself. Um, and remember that epinephrine saves lives. Um, there's absolutely no contraindication to using epinephrine in anaphylaxis. However, if you do have um, any heart condition, especially an arrhythmia, it's important to talk to your cardiologist about what to do, how to manage a food allergic reaction. Uh, you still want to use the epinephrine if you're actually having anaphylaxis, but you want to get to medical help immediately. Next slide. So let's talk a little bit about work. Um, so the hot spots at work are shared kitchens, lunch meetings and celebrations, and networking um, at restaurants, for example. Um, at work, uh, there are simple things you can do, like bringing your own utensils, dishes, mugs, and sponges, um, and, or using disposable, which isn't great for the environment, but safe. Um, you, when you are storing your food in the refrigerator or in the microwave, you want to use secure containers so it can't be contaminated with other food. Um, or if you are able to, to have a private space and private appliances. So for example, um, I have a private uh, microwave in my office, and at one point I did have um, a small refrigerator as well. For potlucks, uh, that's a great opportunity for you to bring a safe food so you can participate in the potluck, but take a little bit of that food aside for you before people start using serving spoons and digging in so that you make sure that your food is safe. Um, and you, there are certain situations where you, where you didn't know a, a meeting was going to happen with an, or didn't know that food was going to be involved, um, but you can still be social. You can have something to drink, you can bring your, your snack from your secret pile um, and still participate. It's important to know your rights. There are laws um, saying that the, your work environment uh, should be safe if you have a medical condition and if you feel like um, that's something that your workspace is unsafe, um, there, there are laws out there to protect you. Next slide. Dining out. So I, um, I'm a foodie. I, I love food. I love going out to restaurants. I love different cuisines. Um, and I've had good and bad experiences at restaurants. Um, and there are some cuisines that um, I do avoid because of my food allergy. One of the things that I often do is research a restaurant or the menu before I go. Um, there are chain restaurants out there that will list all the allergens and their foods on their website. Um, I often look for, do they have peanuts at all in the menu? And if they do, is it only in the desserts? Are they in sauces? Where is it on the menu? And can I, do I feel like I can pick something that would be safe? Um, the other day, a friend was having a, a birthday celebration at a pan-Asian restaurant, which can be a problem for people with peanut allergy. And I called, I looked at the menu and I saw a grilled fish that didn't have a sauce and I thought that looked good. So I called the, actually I emailed um, the manager and I said, hey, I have a peanut allergy. I'm, I'm coming to your restaurant soon. I looked at the menu and I thought this dish would be good. What do you do for food allergic uh, customers? And do you think that this would be um, safe? And they emailed back the next day and they said, absolutely, just tell your server. We will prepare your food in a separate area. You chose a good um, dish that we can prepare safely. Um, so that, again, was a good experience. Um, check in with the hostess and or host uh, when you get to the restaurant. I actually one time went to um, a fancy restaurant in New York and I told them that I have peanut allergy um, when I made the reservation. When I showed up, they said, oh yes, and we have down here that we have a peanut allergy in your party. And everyone down to the bus boy actually knew about the peanut allergy, which was very nice. Again, um, that's an exceptional, uh, exceptionally good experience. Um, you, when you get to the restaurant, you want to discuss the food allergy with your waiter. For me, a good response is, the waiter makes note of it, um, goes back to check with the kitchen, and comes back to confirm that my dish is safe. You want to do that because you never know what changes the chef or the food preparers will make in the kitchen, and it's always good to check with the people who are actually making your food. Um, if you don't get a good response from uh, the waiter, uh, I've had an experience where I've decided not to eat at that restaurant. Um, for example, I, I went to a Mexican restaurant and I looked at the menu. There were a couple of dishes that had peanut on them. And I just checked with the server, you know, are these the only two dishes that have peanut in them? Is there anything else I need to be concerned about? You know, do you think you can make some other dishes in a safe area? She said, oh, I think a couple of other sauces have nuts in it too. Let me go check. So she goes back to the kitchen and then comes back and says, no, 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 actually those sauces are fine. It's just those two dishes. 
By that time, I wasn't feeling as confident. I was getting conflicting information, um, and I didn't feel safe anymore. So I actually ended up leaving that restaurant. Um, you want to confirm when that meal comes to you that it's safe, especially if the waiter has not gotten back to you and confirm that it was safe. Um, don't take a bite until you've asked again. Again, if it doesn't feel right, it's not worth it. Don't eat it. Next slide. Um, pitfalls in restaurants. So servers may not understand the severity or view it or view your allergy as an intolerance, not a true life-threatening food allergy. Um, with a lot of people avoiding gluten and dairy uh, for reasons other than a life-threatening food allergy, um, sometimes it does make that a little bit more difficult for people who have severe food allergies. Um, so it's something that you want to emphasize. This is a life-threatening food allergy. It's a severe food allergy. Um, I can get sick if I eat even a little bit of it. Um, chefs may make last minute changes or substitutions not indicated on the menu. Um, so I did have a patient who had a peanut allergy and her server also had a peanut allergy and she said, no, absolutely, I've had that dessert, you can eat it. When the dessert came, she took a bite and immediately started having symptoms. And it turns out that that day the chef had uh, switched the nuts in that particular dessert. Um, so again, it's always important to check with the kitchen, the people actually making the food. Staff may not realize that, that ingredients contain allergens. So for example, I, have, I had a young patient who had a severe milk allergy, and they were at an Asian restaurant, ordered plain rice, um, developed symptoms within minutes after eating the rice, and it turns out that someone had put a pad of butter um, in that rice and hadn't realized that butter had milk proteins in it. Um, so asking, asking, asking questions and double checking um, is always a good thing. Next slide. Um, FAIR has a great uh, website called Safe FAIR that has other um, information and resources for dining out. There are a lot of states now that have passed laws, uh, sorry, not a lot, there's actually four states <laughs> that have passed laws uh, to make dining out more safe, and that includes training restaurant staff and having posters up about food allergy awareness in the restaurants. And we're really hoping that we can spread that to other states. I think Massachusetts was the first one to do that. Uh, Michigan, Rhode Island, and Virginia also have some laws on the books now. Next slide. So because I love food and going out, um, sometimes I have what's called um, FMO, the fear of missing out. Um, a lot of my friends love Thai food and um, often will take the opportunity when I'm out of town or not available to go to, Thai, to, go to restaurants that I can't go to, which is fine and I get that. I don't want to um, necessarily hold people back. Um, but if I choose to go and want to socialize with them, I could go without eating or I could just have a drink. Um, talking about people who... Um, um, don't have to deal with food allergy on an everyday um, basis themselves. Um, I once went to a allergy conference or meeting, a local allergy meeting, and we um, someone planned uh, the restaurant, not me, ended up at a to be at a Thai restaurant, and I literally sat there and just drank water the entire time. Um, I decided that next time I was going to get involved with of <laughs> where we're going for um, our allergy meetings. Um, the silver lining about having a food allergy for me is that it gave me an incentive to learn how to cook and bake. Um, there are a ton of allergen-free cookbooks out there nowadays. Um, it's one of, again, the silver linings of um, there being more people nowadays with food allergies is because the understanding, the awareness is increasing. Um, you can also be creative with substitutions. I've never been to a Thai restaurant, but I've always wanted to try Pad Thai, so I made it at home once with an almond butter, or you can even use a sunflower seed butter. You can make lasagna with vegan cheese, you can make um, pizza with gluten-free flours, and even baked goods with egg replacers. Next slide. So traveling is the one place where I feel like um, I have had some restrictions. Um, you really have to consider the typical cuisine in that country and the language barrier. Um, for the first time, I went to a country, um, Japan, where I couldn't even read the language. Um, and I chose Japan mainly because they are starting to see an increase of food allergies there, so there's a little bit more public understanding. But in other countries where they don't have a lot of food allergies, um, it could be a difficult thing to understand. They may think that you maybe don't like that food, not that you could actually get very sick from it. So it's important to do your research beforehand. Um, you can research airline accommodations, so when flying, there are a couple of holdouts that still serve peanuts. Um, but there are a lot of um, airlines that have different policies regarding food allergy. 
You want to look for availability of familiar or chain restaurants where you're going that you feel comfortable with, if it's like within the U.S. or even internationally, there are McDonald's around the world. Um, hotel restaurants who deal with more foreign tourists may have more experience with dietary restriction. They may be more helpful and you might be able to eat at least there. You can consider getting a kitchenette or refrigerator in the hotel room or even renting out an apartment like on Airbnb where you can cook your own food. Language cards, so um, I used, I printed out uh, a Japanese language card for my peanut allergy and whenever I was in Japan at a restaurant, I would hand the card to the server um, and I was, I was happy to discover that they took it very seriously. Um, they read it, they would go back in the kitchen, show it and then come back and tell me whether or not my dishes that I chose were safe. Um, smartphones also have dictionaries and readers that can help you translate the menus, um, but also learn some phrases so you can communicate um, in the, uh, to, to people in that country at restaurants and ex at hospitals, for example. You want to know about emergency services, so where is the nearest hospital, and how to, how to call an ambulance in that country. Next slide. Um, on the airplane, you can ask to board early and, and check and clean your area um, and bring your own food. It's something I always do when I travel. Um, I only eat things on the airline if it's packaged and I can read the ingredients. When you're in the country, again, carry safe snacks. Um, I would avoid, I usually advise avoiding street carts because you don't know what the, um, uh, you don't know what, exactly what the ingredients are and you may not be able to communicate with them. Um, and if all else fails, you want to find unprepared food such as fresh fruits and vegetables or plain chicken, for example, or familiar chains um, that you know. Um, to the picture here is a picture I took in Japan. Um, we were at a Starbucks and my traveling partner um, is lactose intolerant and actually asked for soy milk because she was handed this card and I was so impressed by this. It says, please hand this card to your barista at the handoff. So that means that when you got your drink, you handed them this card and they verify that they put soy milk in your drink. Again, it's checking with the person who's actually preparing your food um, to make sure that it's safe. Um, and I wish they had that here in the U.S. I was very impressed by that. Um, safety. You always, when you're traveling, you want to bring extra medications. You may not be able to get a prescription or find a doctor necessarily where you're going. You want to wear medical identification, especially if you're traveling by yourself. Next slide. Camping and hiking, special considerations. Often when you go camping and hiking, um, you're sharing food, you're cooking food together, and you're sharing equipment. You also may be far from emergency services. So for me, when I go camping, I often um, ask the group I'm going with if, if we could not bring any peanut at all. Um, and I and I substitute it. I'll say, I'll, I'll bring some almond butter, I'll bring some sunflower seed butter, you know, as a substitute. Um, in general, that has worked. Um, one time, a family member of a friend came and wasn't on the email uh, um, communication that we were sending back and forth about food and who's bringing what, um, and ended up bringing a whole tub of peanut butter and some nutter butters. Now, we weren't too far out from emergency services, but it still made me nervous. And I spent a good deal of time watching where that peanut butter was going and watching which utensils were being used for it, etc. Um, on that side, it is it, it, you can make it easier on yourself if you bring dedicated storage, utensils, dishes, and equipment. And again, and I'll repeat it many times, bring safe snacks with you. Also have extra medications just in case it takes you um, some time to get emergency, to emergency services, services if an accidental ingestion or reaction were to occur. Next slide. Um, so talking about relationships, um, when you uh, have someone who's allergic to one food, um, it's important, um, especially when you have any intimate contact with them, that you're not being exposed um, to that allergen. Um, in a couple of studies, between 5 and 12 percent of food allergic patients report symptoms after kissing a partner who had ingested their allergen. Um, and in uh, what we call the kissing study, uh, where they measured uh, peanut allergen in the saliva, um, about in about five subjects, after five minutes, they didn't find any peanut allergen in their saliva. And we're not exactly sure how that happened. Um, but an hour later, about six more of those subjects didn't have any peanut allergen in their saliva. But there was one subject that still had peanut allergen in their saliva about four and a half hours later. So in general, um, what we've learned from that study is that the best, best method is really to avoid the allergen your partner is allergic to. Um, but if it is eaten, the best technique um, to uh, decrease your risk of a reaction is to wait several hours, so uh, a waiting period, and uh, for that person to eat several allergen-free meals in between. 
From the study, we did learn that brushing teeth and chewing gum did not dramatically reduce peanut levels immediately. So really, waiting um, and eating other foods are the best ways. Next slide. So I believe um, that you can live a, a safe and fulfilling life with food allergies. And I think I'm a testament to that. The things that I've been able to do is, you know, I, I've learned how to bake and cook a lot. So I get to try dishes that I wouldn't otherwise necessarily be able to because I can't travel to that country or go to that restaurant. Um, I lived in New York City for 10 years and I ate out at least once a week. Um, I've flown in airplanes since I was two. I've traveled to Europe, South America, and Japan. I've gone camping and hiking, and I've gone to concerts and sporting events. Now, there are some ups and downs. It doesn't mean that I haven't been accident-free. I've probably had about four reactions in my adult lifehood, um, and, and three out of those four times I used my EpiPen uh, or my um, ep epinephrine auto-injector. Um, one time I was in Peru, um, and I actually didn't realize that one of the national dishes they have there has ground up peanuts in it. Um, and at that time, it was, I was in college, it was before medical school, and I was too scared to use uh, my um, epinephrine auto-injector. Um, I didn't really know how to use it, I didn't know what would happen if I used it. And um, since becoming a doctor, I have realized how safe epinephrine can be and how vital it is to, control, um, to stopping reactions and keeping you safe. Um, so it's, I understand that fear of using it, um, and it's something that I counsel my patients on on a daily basis. Um, I also have learned that because I uh, am allergic to peanut, but can tolerate other tree nuts, um, I've started to eat tree nuts uh, when I was out at restaurants. And I had an accidental ingestion once when I ate a pesto that had pine nuts in it. I can eat pine nuts. And I asked the right questions. <clears throat> I, you know, I said, I'm allergic to peanuts. I wanted to know what's in your pesto. It's pine nuts. Great. Um, so I ate the sandwich with the pine nuts, and about half an hour later, I started experiencing symptoms. When I went back to the restaurant and asked, um, they said, no, 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 it's definitely pine nuts in that pesto, and then they walked away. And then they came back a few minutes later, and they said, uh-oh, we grind all of our nuts in the same grinder, and they had had peanuts on the salad bar, and I knew that, and I avoided all the salads. So I thought I had taken the best precautions, but it still happened. And that, and it, you know, it could have been a large piece of peanut or a small piece of peanut that was um, mixed into the pesto, and I don't know. Um, but my new rule is, and I always learn something new when this happens, my new rule is if I cannot see that tree nut, if it's mixed into something or chopped into something, then I'm not eating it. Um, so everybody kind of finds their own ways of dealing with food allergies. Um, and uh, I think that when there's a will, there's a way. Um, I have one patient, um, extraordinary patient, who um, has the goal of uh, working with animal conservation in places like China, and she has a peanut allergy. And she has gone over there several summers in a row and has brought um, food with her, enough food to cook for herself for weeks. Um, she was once staying with a family, um, a host family, and she had told them that she needs, you know, separate utensils and cooking things. Um, and they ended up buying her a whole new set of pots and pans, which was very generous. And she has learned to cook bread for herself and other things just to make sure that she can still follow her dreams, even though she has a food allergy. Um, so one of my dreams, and hopefully someday I will make it there, uh, is to travel to places like Southeast Asia, China, and Africa. Um, and to be able to go there and be safe. Um, I do have a friend in Thailand um, who used to do food allergy research in the United States. And my idea was if I hang out with her and she speaks the language and she understands food allergy, maybe I could go someday. Next slide. In the end, um, I think that there is kind of a continuum of um, how you can deal with uh, your food allergy. You know, on one end, um, it's to uh, fear of even being near things that you're allergic to, um, avoiding social situation, avoiding traveling, avoiding doing things that you really want to do. And on the other end is not taking the food allergy serious enough that you take risks and eat things that may not be safe. And I think all of us hope to be somewhere in the middle where we're safe but also get to participate in all the things um, that are great in life. Thank you. That's the end of my talk. And I'm um, happy to take um, any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you, Dr. Leonard. Um, I just want to do a really quick sound check if somebody wouldn't mind responding in the chat window or audio or uh, the questions window. Somebody had reported they lost audio and I want to make sure that we, that you all can hear us and it, it might not be isolated. So, okay. Fantastic. <laughs> a few people have responded that they can hear, so I call that good. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for helping us figure that out. Um, 
So a few questions have come through, and we have about 10 minutes to kind of address questions. Um, to address questions. Um, and so if any additional questions uh, have popped up in your head after uh, today's webinar, please feel free to um, ask them here. Um, one of the questions that came through is about food allergy management when pregnant. Um, the question specifically says, can you speak at all about managing food allergies when pregnant and if treatment of a reaction differs while pregnant? I've developed food allergies as an adult during two previous pregnancies, and she is curious how common this may be. Um, as to the prevalence of developing food allergies when you're pregnant, um, I'm not sure we have that data, but I have heard um, patients and, and have seen patients where that has happened, so it's not um, uncommon. Um, the, you want to be particularly careful uh, when you're pregnant and you have life-threatening food allergies um, because uh, anaphylaxis when you have anaphylaxis or you have a drop in blood pressure or you, have, or you develop anaphylaxis shock, then you're, you're having trouble getting blood and oxygen to important areas of the body, including, um, including the fetus. Um, you still need to treat. So um, any mild symptoms, for example, I usually uh, distill it down to any symptoms on the outside of the body, like a rash, give antihistamine and monitor. Um, any symptoms on the inside of the body, if you're having trouble breathing, if you have a drop in blood pressure, whether you're pregnant or not, you still need to use the EpiPen, but you want to get to immediate medical care. Um, the, I usually advise um, um, pregnant patients to be extra careful um, in, in stric strictly avoiding foods um, because there can be uh, side effects. Um, that we want to avoid. We want to make sure that um, the blood flow is still going to the fetus. That's the most important thing. Um, but you still have to, number one, you have to treat the reaction. Number two, get to medical care. Um, for more specific advice, I would talk to um, your obstetrician or allergist um, if your situation may be slightly different. OK, great. Thank you. Another question came through um, from an individual who's been having some problems with meetings at work, um, in many cases, um, she reports that, um, for example, bowls of mixed nuts are set out for the meeting, coworkers are then eating nuts, shaking hands, passing papers, and so on. And so she finds herself um, anxious and needing to leave meetings early, um, which then upsets her manager. So um, any recommendations in terms of how to address some of these workplace um, issues? So at work, um, if these are meetings that are planned ahead, um, uh, one of the advice I usually give is get involved in um, what kind of food is being provided. Um, if it's a surprise meeting or someone forgets and they're putting out something that you're allergic to, uh, again, being in the same room as your allergen is not going to cause a reaction. But if you're concerned about cross contact, like people touching the nuts and then touching, like shaking your hand, et cetera, or touching a pen on the table, um, the number one thing you can do to protect yourself is always wash your hand before you touch food and put that in your mouth. So really, you have to get whatever allergen it is into your mouth to have a reaction. So one, that's protecting yourself. Two, it's bringing your own food if you need it, so always having safe snacks at work. And three, it's trying to talk to your manager who's upset if you're leaving early and explaining what the situation is, explaining that it can be dangerous, and offering um, an alternative for them. Can I bring some goldfish crackers? Uh, instead of nuts. Um, can I help you, can you let me know when you're planning foods and, and I can um, help find alternatives that, that everyone would like, um, but that, that would also make me feel safe. And again, you do have rights at work to have a safe work environment, so if it gets to that um, situation, then um, you can seek some help uh, through HR or human resources. And I'll just add on to that that um, in May, FAIR actually did another webinar that was uh, specific to workplace rights. And um, it was it's really helpful in sort of helping secure ADA accommodations and understanding what your, what your employee rights are. So if you go to FAIR's website, there is a recording and slides from that webinar available as well. Um, a couple of questions have come through from some individuals that are interested in, um, they're looking to travel to China and are wondering if you have any specific yeah. recommendations as far as that goes. So China is tough. Um, I, I, I'm assuming, I'm, I'm guessing that they have a peanut allergy or a nut allergy. Um, uh, China 
is seeing some increase in food allergy, but not a lot. Um, the they don't have um, food allergy labeling laws like we do. Um, they may not understand how severe it can be. Um, and it, for me, I haven't solved the China travel issue yet. Um, uh, like I said, one of my patients who went to China um, took literally all of her food with her. She got those packets that you can take when you're backpacking, those like free dry packets, and she brought other things that she could then either add water to or fresh fruits and vegetables to when she was there. I, I don't think that's a solution for everybody. Um, the other solution would be, depending on where you're going, are you staying at a hotel that um, is used to having foreign tourists? Are you going on? Are you going for vacation? Are you on a um, uh, like a planned, uh, like a, a travel trip uh, where you have people who are taking you around? Um, they can be uh, your guides, uh, especially if they speak the language and know the local culture. Um, but again, if you're going to travel to some place. Um, like that that doesn't have a lot of experience with food allergies or regulations. Um, you want to bring food, say food with you just in case. You want to stick to things that are unprepared uh, without sauces, etc. Um, and you want to always carry extra medications just in case you're in a place where you can't get to emergency services um, easily. Um, I think that uh, there are some expats that live in China and sometimes they do have um, boards um, online boards where you can talk to them and say, how, how are you living in China? How are you doing this? And you can try to get some advice from them as well. Um, it, it's something that, that I'm still trying to figure out. <laughs> um, but I think, again, if, where there's a will, there, there is a way. It may take some research and preparing before you go. Great. Thank you. Um, a few questions have come through about communication strategies and helping, under, helping others understand the sensitivity and the seriousness of a food allergy, um, whether during flying and things like that. But there are a few people that have kind of shared incidents about um, about people not being understanding, kind of rolling their eyes, groaning about it. And so um, any communication strategies that you might be able to share with the group? Um, yeah, it's, again, I'm, I'm hoping as food allergy awareness gets better that the public will We'll also learn more about food allergies, and it will get easier. But um, there's still we still have a long way to go. Um, and I think from from my uh, experience, um, I I try to be not too um, red flag about it, but try to kind of explain, um, you know, this is something that can be serious. Um, even a little bit can cause a reaction. I could end up going to the ER. Um, it can be life-threatening. Um, and this ca and and explaining what the experience is like for you. You know that this causes me to be very anxious. Um, you know, I I still want to really eat at your restaurant. I still would like to participate in this activity. Um, and these are these are the things that would help me feel safer. Um, again, using humor, um, understanding that. It, this is probably not from any ill will on their part, but they just don't get it. Um, I've had I have families that come into my office now who have never had any type of allergy in their family, and all of a sudden their their child has a peanut allergy, and you know they they have no idea. They didn't even know what an allergy was like. Most people think that an allergy is you know like a runny nose or sneezing. Um, so you have to ex you do have to sometimes explain. Sometimes they just don't understand, and giving them a little information can help. Um, we try, the best thing is to try to find people who um, do understand um, and surround yourself with those people. So we know that kids who have a good friends group in school um, uh, will often help to protect them. Uh, and and you can't win everybody, <laughs> um, but we're hoping that together as we get food awareness out there that it will get easier. Um, but I think that uh, choose your battles is one of um, the advice that I would also give um, if it doesn't seem like a situation where it's uncomfortable or they don't seem to get it um, I would I usually would remove myself from that situation I would go find an alternative um, activity or alternative food that that I feel safe with because at the end of the day it's not worth you getting sick um, but I, I understand and I empathize um, that sometimes not everybody understands um, I do get that great 
Thank you. Um, I think we have time for about one more question. If, um, if you have submitted a question or you have a question that you didn't submit and wanted to send privately, um, you can email it to us at education at foodallergy.org and we can uh, follow up with Dr. Leonard on that separately. Um, if you, one of the questions that came through, which I think is something that is fairly common for um, adults with food allergies, is how do you recommend handling alcohol where they don't have ingredient labels for the products because they're not covered under uh, the Food Allergen Labeling Consumer Protection Act? So it depends on, it depends on what your allergy is. Um, for nut allergy sufferers, um, alcohol is usually safe, except for a few. Um, they're either almond or hazelnut based. Um, but more recently, I've been seeing craft beers being uh, flavored with peanut, um, which I was um, bummed <laughs> to uh, discover. Um, so you certainly, if you're in a place where, uh, like a like a brewery, where they're actually making the beer, you can ask questions. Um, if not, um, the best way to do it is to call that company. Um, if you are concerned that there may be an allergen in the um, alcohol that you are interested in drinking. Um, if, if you're at a place and it's new alcohol that you've never had and you're not sure and it seems flavored, um, I would avoid it until you can get more information. Um, on that note, um, we, we do know that there have been a couple of rare cases where um, people have been able, or, or, or alcohol has actually lowered the threshold to cause a reaction in certain people. So for example, we had one patient who, was, um, who could eat peanuts and drink wine separately but not together. Um, so we do think that sometimes alcohol will reduce your digestion of foods and that could lower the threshold to an allergic reaction. Um, so it's something to be aware of. I think it's extremely rare. Um, but also to be aware that when you're drinking alcohol, sometimes your um, inhibitions may be lowered um, and you may take additional risks. Um, so it's safest to always um, have your wits about you when you're eating um, and drinking alcohol. Great. Thank you. That will um, bring us to our time for today. And, and Dr. Leonard, I do want to thank you once again for spending time with us today and for sharing your expertise, your experience, and such really valuable information. Um, after this webinar and in your post-webinar follow-up email from FAIR, a short survey link will be included for you to share feedback on today's presentation and provide comments on webinar topics you'd like to see in the future. So if you could, please take a minute to complete this and help us to continue to deliver meaningful information. Um, as part of our webinar series. So next month we will be uh, taking a look beyond the top eight and we'll be focusing on sesame and we'll be joined by Dr. Robert Wood, Chief of Pediatric Allergy and Immunology at Johns Hopkins Children's Center. Dr. Wood will be addressing the management of sesame allergy in this webinar, which will include information on understanding the documented increase in sesame prevalence, insights on food labeling for sesame, and strategies for individuals with sesame to be mindful of in practicing avoidance of their allergen. FAIR member priority registration will be open on Monday, September 28th, and general registration for this webinar will take place on Monday, October 5th. The webinar itself will be taking place on Wednesday, October 14th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. So that will conclude today's webinar. I'd like to thank all of you again for joining us, and um, we hope to see you again next month. And thanks again, Dr. Leonard. Great. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>